But uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Dixon, he is an NFT artist. He's an artist who's uh, started getting involved with NFTs and he's really done it in such a way that uh, is very different from everyone else. Jonathan, very good to have you back on the show. Thanks very much. Uh, nice to be here. Um, I'm actually, I'm slightly flustered because I actually just sat down at my Mac. I thought I wasn't on for an hour because our clocks have changed with uh, summertime. So uh, <laughs> if I'm a bit flustered, don't mind me. I'll settle into it pretty quick. <laughs> Been there, done that. One thing uh, with doing your Cardano update and talking with people from all over the world is uh, yeah. is I've really learned what GMT is all about. So I can, you know, yeah. what GMT are you at? And I can kind of... Then that's very strange. And and there was I, I can't even get that right, man. <laughs> we got British summer's time, we've got GMT, I just I just to try and I, confuse I the rest of the world. It. <laughs> yeah. Well we would have had a couple more guests, friends of the show, um yeah. on, except it's two o'clock in the middle of the night in Korea or something oh, okay. along enough. those lines. So Jonathan, did you get a chance to look at any of the comments um, from the interview we did before? Anything on Twitter? I didn't know. I, I actually wasn't able to look at the comments, but I, I had a good look at the interview and um, hoping you'd fill me in. Why was there good feedback on it? Oh, incredible people? feedback. Yeah, yeah, there was incredible Thanks. feedback. And I'm really excited to talk with you again yeah. uh, for two, two things. One thing you really um, said in our first interview that I'd like for you to elaborate on you used um, beautifully uh, articulate descriptive words to describe the difference between fungible and non-fungible tokens. Remember when you talked about the sky? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wondered if you just, because that's, that was just golden, maybe you could, for our audience, kind of explain your perspective on the difference between an NFT and a, 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 a native asset, so to speak. Yeah, okay. So I think what I'd said to you about an NFT was, that if you imagine um, the, a, a pure blue sky that's completely cloudless and it's just that kind of lovely blue, um, if you split that up into smaller parts, it still remains, the visual is still a blue sky of sorts. So it doesn't really change. But if you get view look, so that, that in a sense is um, a, a fungible image. So the sky is, you can chop it up into different parts and it's still going to be a blue sky. And then I said that a cloudy sky is a non-fungible image. So you take a cloudy sky and if you take a section of it, um, a small section out, out of that sky, and all, each different section of that cloudy sky is going to have a different image in it. So they, each image itself becomes a non-fungible image. So is that is that okay? It makes sense? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And I just think that that's... that... Would you say that kind of links to what you're trying to do? Is it going to be like... Is it going to be like one picture split up into multiple things? And then I guess you could have like collectors be like, well, I want to collect all, all parts of this, of this yeah. artwork. <clears throat> yeah, very much so. Um, the original piece I did was I took, I was explaining to James, I took a, um, an ADA transaction code and wrote this code for myself. And I used an abstract painting mm -hmm. that I'd done. And I used the code to extract parts of that abstract painting to to basically create oh. this other image. So yeah, basically some of the images that I'm gonna do will be very, very much linked between each other. Um, okay. So there will be a suite of images, but I, I also kind of went on from that then to think that if you have a collection of images, um, there's also pieces of information that exist between the images. So that sounds a bit kind of, uh, I'll make it more concrete. When the simulation if you, if you, <laughs> <laughs> you tell you tell a person there's a, a story right if you break a story up into component parts and you split it all out so you get incomplete parts of a story and sometimes your imagination will fill up those incomplete pieces between the story and that filled in incomplete piece can become an actual oh, yeah. part of the story so yeah. i was i'm kind of thinking of linking up nfts that there's some of the information that's given between them is vague enough to allow the person's imagination to refill in the rest of it. And it's like the magic that happens between the notes and music, or it's like the ghost yeah. in the machine where stuff takes on a life of its own that only exists because of the two other concrete parts, but it's not concrete itself, but exists in the mind of the person that's 
kind of yeah. you know involved with it so yeah like serializing art and doing loads of different projects based on that is something i'm very very interested in doing you are gonna be super busy man <laughs> I mean, if, it, if, if it's uh if it's like artwork split up for multiple yeah. people it, how will you manage your time how will you manage to like are you gonna have a team of artists or something like one day or is it just right now one man band no um at the minute it's it's i'm gonna be doing it myself i already have um i kind of work i have a lot of i have a huge back catalogue of images that have been taken for i do kind of more traditional artwork as well i do paintings that one on yeah, screen there that. is yeah so yeah, it's um i've lots of work that i've done before um, and I'm going to bring some of that in as well because I love messing with perception and time and stuff. So I bring images that I've done from the past into work that I'm doing at the minute. I also do, um, I'm doing a project on forests and paintings and I was telling James that I paint. Um, I've put these really strict, guy, these strict kind of uh, restrictions on myself. So I come from a design background and I kind of like the structure that I used to have. So I brought that into my fine art practice. So I'm doing this, these series of paintings based in forests, but I've given myself like these strict guidelines that I have to, I, I can only go to certain forests that were during walking distance of my house. I can only photograph certain areas in them. And I can only photograph them at certain times of year and certain times of day. And there's a reason behind all, I didn't just make it up just for the crack. I kind of, there's a big reason behind all of that. Oh, but right, I find yeah. that that friction that comes out of forcing yourself to do something in a way that's a little bit um, restrictive, it's like the heat of that friction is the creative idea that gets sparked out of it. And I find it sounds, it can sound like it's when you're making up all these different ideas and parameters, but they actually work. Um, and the work that I've done has proved it and it's kind of spurs me on. Yeah, so sure. usually when I'm doing a project, like with that Gordon Moore portrait, that's called Gordon Moore Superposition. So I wanted to show how visually you can create an abstract and a figurative painting at the same time, echoing qubits in quantum computing. So when you view that painting, as James has shown you, in real life, you can't actually make out the image very easily the brush strokes in the painting are way more obvious than the image but when you stand right back from it it was designed to be put into a room that was um i can't remember the exact place where it was going to be put but the length of the room but the distance that you had to stand back to view the painting it just turns into this really photographic uh, likeness so two people can be in the room viewing the painting at the same time and one sees an abstract painting with all these brush strokes and the other person sees a really realistic portrait so that was a constraint that i put on myself to do that and to see what would happen and then out of that then came the the other paintings that came after it and then following on from that so this one is again it was a follow-on from that but the constraint on this painting was that the image was taken at exactly sundown on the darkest day of the year because i love the split between um there was other reasons for that there's a split in personalities of people i have things going on in my head there's i could talk to you for about half an hour about this painting with the ideas behind it the building as well is also um the royal college of surgeons training building in ireland and they train um medics that work both in physical medicine and psychological medicine as well so i chose every single part of every single image has this big backstory behind it so that's how i ended up with that and then following on from that came the um this is the abstract painting that i did that i based the other the ada transaction code aesthetics out of so I take a certain section of that painting and I've gridded it all up and it's all each square is mm. named with a letter and a number. And then below that, then I took an added transaction code and applied a code that I extracted from the added transaction code to create these pieces from. And they will eventually then, at the minute, these are photographic work. So I took um, extreme close up photographs of the um squares on the painting to create these so these codes in these paintings are all crackable if you have my code and you have the original painting and the age of transaction code i wanted to get an aesthetic out of what would happen when you if you did this so these will eventually then be turned back into real huge paintings my goal is to have these paintings about maybe 
like two or three meters wide and a meter and a half tall and use what I extracted here to recreate an aesthetic back into the real world. Just playing with the virtual world and the real world. That again. is super cool. So it's using the transaction for your code to make those smaller um, blocks of color. So, well, let's say color yeah. from a, was from a, from far back, it would just be a block of color. And then yeah, you're going to, much. you're going to use that to actually recreate a full image. If you stand far away from it, like a, an actual image that the eye can, <clears throat> That you can make out. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'm gonna yeah. expand on from that. So that was the first time I did it, and I kind of and it worked as well, and I got a good reaction aesthetically. So I want to see right, what else can you do with that? And there is my head just exploded after that. So I could talk to you for an hour. Yeah, my <laughs> head is exploding. <laughs> Just uh, listening yeah, to you, I love how it's uh, uh, a clash of like digital and analog. I mean, yeah. art is just so analog and you're just taking these digital transactions that there's just, you know, no distinguishing between one from another because they're so unique and turning yeah. it into a beautiful aesthetic piece of art. It's incredible. Yeah, and I think that's some of that's to do with the, I think the kind of brain I have, I see, I kind of see stuff in terms of visuals anyway. And even with maths, I was saying to you before, I, I, when I was a kid in school, when I was you know, like maybe a teenager in school, one of my lecturers was giving us this, I was being given a maths lecture and I didn't really understand a whole heap about um, what she was talking about. But suddenly she started talking and it's like as if everything I said in my head went fuzzy in the last time. But my head actually everything became very clear in my head. I could almost visualize what she was talking about. I remember listening to her words and she was talking about algebra and talking about different trigonometry and it all made sense in my head for a short period of time. And I, that kind of made me think, Jesus, there's so much linkage between the world of coding and the world of maths and physics and all. And it's like the the way I kind of rationalize it, I, I, I actually wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. So it says like mathematicians, mathematicians, physicists, poets, painters, and artists are all after the same thing. And it's to deepen the mystery by gaining a better understanding of it. So the more you understand the mystery of everything that goes on on our planet, the more wonderful and beautiful it becomes. Mm -hmm. So art and maths and science and physics and engineering, everything does the exact same thing. It deepens the mystery of the wonder of what we're doing as people. And I think Cardano blasted my head out of it on a whole other level in that way. So I'll tend to latch on to stuff that makes me feel that way. And this certainly did it. So I just got really excited and wanted to keep going on it. So Jonathan, I think you're one of my favorite guests of all time. You're just it's just so cool to listen to you and, and to yeah, you you clear it's so obvious to see that you're thinking differently. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> That's great to hear. But it's good to get good feedback because sometimes when you're living in your head with it all, you kind of get, uh, you kind of go, am I going mad? And is anybody else going to see this? Whatever you Don't let the mean, simulation are, get you. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> you understand the simulation. All right, Jonathan, it's about time for us to wrap it up. We're going to be talking about mission driven stake pools next. I am so oh, grateful wow. for you uh, coming back on the show and talking to us even more and i do look forward to our very next conversation brilliant thanks very much for having me and i'm delighted um you enjoyed what i have to do so there'll be plenty more to come so watch out <laughs> all right great well yeah, keep yeah. in touch we look forward to talking to you again yeah for sure thanks a million thanks all right take care thanks Jonathan.